Thank you, uh, Vice Chancellor. I'm, I'm wearing a scarf because I don't know if all of you feel as cold as I do in here. But when I first arrived, it was distinctly chilly, and uh, I just thought I'd take precaution, you know, just in, in case my uh, throat dried up. Um, I've got three speakers who are asked to join me up here on the podium in a moment. But what they're going to talk to you about, fantastic, as it says, future of human health, a, a decent sized topic for a big university to think about. So where is medicine going? <clears throat> well, you've already heard how good our medical sciences division is, so I'm going to make the claim Oxford's the best place to go to find out. I'm also going to make a second claim, which is that part of the reason Oxford is so good at it is because it has exceptionally strong links with China. So, that's going to be about how does East meet West, and when doesn't it? And why does it matter when it doesn't? And I think we can, I can say that all of our speakers are going to address aspects of this in complementary ways, and I hope that at the end, uh, the questions will help us to pull together the common threads that run through all of this. So, first, Xin Li, who was educated in China up until master's level, and then came to the UK for her PhD, not to Oxford, but we've got her now. And she studies cancers. Why do common cancers occur differently in the West and in the East? If we understood that, we perhaps understand what's the common cause of both variants. And once you understand common causes, you're in a position to try and do something about it. So that's the first place in which differences are going to tell us something. Second, within cancers, why do some cells in a tumor decide to migrate and spread and take up residence and duplicate, replicate elsewhere? So what causes metastasis? And I think she's going to tell you something about that. So, that's about individual differences in populations, if you like, and individual differences between cells. Jonathan Flint, a very old friend of mine, a, a, an Oxford product, a historian originally, but he's, he's moved on since then, um, is going to talk about genetics, the role of genetics. He's running some of the world's biggest studies in China. How far do your genes explain, explain your mental life, actually? with a particular emphasis on anxiety and depression. So Jonathan will take you into that. And then Chaz Buntra, who's the third speaker, another friend of mine from some way back now, though he, you'll see he looks very young. Um, one way, you know, what's, what, how do we manage these conditions? Well, of course, one way to do it is by developing new drugs. But actually, drug development has pretty much hit the buffers. And I think Chaz will tell you something about that. And there's a new way to develop new drugs. And Chaz is really the pioneer of one of these new ways to do things, and he's doing that here in Oxford. And then, just to show that our Vice Chancellor is not merely a pretty face and a good talker, some of what he does in structural chemistry feeds back into the sorts of things that Jin Li herself is doing in her work. So, all of them have a common link in looking to the medicine of the future. So may I invite all three speakers up, and we'll just kick off. They'll introduce themselves, their topics, and we'll get going. Right, so good morning. I'm going to be talking to you for the next 15 minutes about depression. And, um, <laughs> this is the commonest condition for psychiatrists to deal with. It's the second cause of morbidity worldwide. And despite that, uh, it's a condition whose origins we know relatively little about compared to other common conditions. So you've heard that there are, in many countries, an institute for cancer studies. There are institutes for the study of hypertension, bowel disease, and liver. But no country has an institute for the study of depression. Well, with one exception I discovered recently, which is Australia. And there's a reason for this, which is that no one's really going to commit large amounts of money to a condition where they don't think they're going to get much success. And the problem with depression is it's a very complex, protein manifestation. So it has a mixture of psychological 
and physiological features which are well known to psychiatrists, but if you think about them, are hard to understand. We can appreciate why someone who has given up interest in living wouldn't want to eat and drink. But it's not clear, at least to me, why someone who's very, very unhappy should have trouble falling asleep. And if they do fall asleep, why do they wake up so early in the morning, still feeling very tired and miserable? So, in addition, if we look at what we understand about the causes, it's also not clear how they cohere. I think everyone's familiar with the idea that adversity makes you unhappy, that fate crushes our mood, makes us bad-tempered, irritable, and in certain circumstances, miserable, depressed. But we also know that's not the whole story by any means. And again and again, when researchers have looked at what are called stressful life events and associated them with depression, they get pictures like this, whereby you can see in the red bars, which are those with depression, there are many, many people who get very depressed with no apparent cause, and also many people who have suffered very severe life events and yet remain cheerful. Now, when you're faced with a, a, a complex problem uh, like this, there are uh, a number of things you can do. One thing we know about depression is that it does have a genetic component. So I'm showing you here uh, data on the heritability, that's the extent to which the disorder has a, a heritable component. And you can see I've shown in red males and blue in females, and it's about 40 or 50 percent, which is about the same as um, diabetes or obesity. But what this also shows is the correlation between what, at a genetic level, makes a man depressed and what makes a woman depressed. And that's the green bar. If that green bar went up to 100, it would tell you that the same genes operate in men and women. And it's nowhere near around. It's more like 55. In other words, at a genetic level, this is actually almost two separate conditions. An incredibly complicated disorder. So in order to try and simplify things, over the last seven years, uh, as you'll see, I've been working with colleagues to try and identify simpler components. So as in this case, rather than work with a condition which is different between men and women, let's just work with one sex, who we've chosen to work with women. And in order to deal with the other complexities I've mentioned, we need to collect as much information as we can, and we need to do so in a very large sample, because we think the contributions of each factor are relatively small. And to do this, we need to work in a country with a large population. Many, many people we're going to have to screen. And we need that country to have a, an effective healthcare system with many doctors who we can train to work with us to collect the information we need. So since 2008, I've been working with hospitals across China to collect about 6,000 patients, women, with depression and 6,000 patient, uh, 6,000 controls to compare them with. And by middle of 2012, we'd established collaborations with about 50 or 60 hospitals in 30 cities spread across China. This meant that I, over that period of time, have visited more psychiatric hospitals, I think, than any person now on the planet. <laughs> And as you can tell, this has been quite a wearing enterprise. <laughs> so what did we learn? Well, the first thing, and most importantly, is that depression in China is the same as depression elsewhere. All the information we collected pointed in the same direction. This is important because many people, when I tell them about our work, immediately say something like, isn't it different in China? There are cultural differences, surely. And I have to say, we never found those, with one exception. One of the things we ask about is parenting. And we ask a series of questions from which we extract three measures. One of these is warmth, another is authoritarianism, and the last one is protectiveness. And then you can imagine, warm parents tend to protect their children, authoritarian parents to make their children more likely to become depressed. And we found this both 
in China and in the West. Protectiveness measures the extent to which parents want their children to come back home on time, not maybe wear unusual clothes, and particularly do their homework. And this in the West tends to be slightly detrimental to the mental health of their offspring. But in China, it's slightly protective. So I would suggest that maybe there is some truth in the value of the tiger mother. But other than this, the condition is the same. Now, in addition to all of the interview data that we've collected, we also, in collaboration with, the, with BGI, which in Shenzhen is the largest genomic center in the world, we sequenced, we obtained the DNA sequence of all the people in the study. I want to tell you just one result that we have, which points to a new understanding of how this condition arises. So I think most people are familiar with the idea that our DNA is contained within cells in the body in units called chromosomes. We have two copies of each chromosome, one from the mother, one from the father. But people perhaps are less familiar with the idea that there is another sort of DNA in each cell. And this, this DNA is contained in an organelle called the mitochondrion, which is the source of energy for each cell. So cells, like in the brain, which need lots of energy, have many mitochondria. And the mitochondria has its own genome, a small circular molecule. And when we sequenced all of our patients and the controls, we sequenced that mitochondrial genome. And we made a very surprising discovery. We found that the patients had more mitochondria than the controls. And we also found that the extent to which that happened depended upon the stressful life events that these patients had suffered. The more stressful the life events and the more severe those were, then the more mitochondria we were detecting. This was a very strange finding, one that we worried about, but we're scientists, so we set up an experiment to test whether it's true. And to do so, we didn't do this in people, we did it in, in mice. I won't tell you how we stressed the mice, but we did. And then we measured their mitochondria. And what you can see is over four weeks of stress, indeed, as we predicted, their mitochondria increased. And what this suggested to us was, in a way, maybe just by testing the mitochondria of people in this audience, we could tell something about how badly life had treated them. But why should something which is to do with the metabolism of an individual have anything to do with their mental state? So it turns out that mitochondria are not just to do with energy. They also have another role. And in parts of the brain, their activity can actually turn <coughs> off and turn on neuronal activity. And the activity of the mitochondria is driven by the metabolic state of the individual. And by turning neurons on and off, they actually can alter behavior. They can, as we know in animals, determine to some extent the food-seeking behavior. And what this suggested to us was that there might be what I'll call a metabolic theory of depression. And that is to say that the vegetative symptoms, the problems with sleep, with eating that I've talked about, those symptoms might represent uh, an evolutionary conserved mechanism, which is a response to a predicted deficit in food. So throughout evolutionary history, the key, the critical element for survival has been access to food. And this means that really, probably the major reason why we have a brain is to predict when you're next going to have a meal. And therefore, depression is, in a sense, partly at least, a question of entering a state where food is likely to be absent or scarce. scarce. And in that circumstance, you need to stop eating, but you need to remain awake to discover where your next meal might be coming from. So this is an idea which we're now investigating. We're continuing to work with our colleagues in China to push this work further forward. And what I really just want to point out to you with this story is how, in a collaborative study like this, using the new genomic technologies, we can begin to make inroads into some of the more intractable problems that exist in medicine. Thank you.
<laughs> Thank you very much. I've always wondered why I had a brain, and it's sort of good to have some, some basis for it now. <laughs> I'm, I'm deeply relieved, and I hope the rest of the audience is also reassured that you are now understood. Um, the third speaker is Chas Bertra, who is going to talk about what he's doing in developing new drugs, and doing it, as I say, following a new model. So, Chas, over to you. And then questions after that. So what I'll try and do in the next 15 minutes or so is just give you a sense of what we're doing in Oxford to try and catalyze the discovery of pioneer medicines. So by pioneer medicines, I mean completely novel forms of treatment for many diseases. First of all, let's just paint the picture. So society desperately needs more effective and safer medicines. One, with an aging society, and two, with diseases of modern living. So let me just elaborate on that. Aging society. In the UK, in the year 2050, 27% of the society will be over the age of 65. In Japan, that figure is closer to 30%. It's hard for many of us to imagine that one in three people in society over the age of 65. And of course, over the age of 65, what happens is the incidence of cardiovascular disease goes up almost exponentially. The incidence of cancer goes up almost exponentially. The incidence of dementia goes up almost exponentially. For all of these, we need better treatment. I said diseases of modern living. In some parts of the world, we've almost got epidemics in diabetes and obesity and associated cardiovascular disease. So our need for novel medicines is going up. Let's now paint the picture of what's happening in the biomedical community and the pharmaceutical industry. Discovering new medicines frankly, is incredibly difficult. Let me just illustrate that. In Alzheimer's, now this is one disease which, frankly, if we don't come up with a new treatment in the next 20 years, this one disease is going to financially cripple many societies. Now, in the past decade, there have been 13 very large phase three clinical studies with novel potential treatments. Some of these studies cost several hundred million dollars. One of them cost $600 million. All of them failed. All of these studies failed. We are not even close to getting a treatment that's going to slow down the progression of this horrible disease. If we now think about what the costs are for research and development in the pharmaceutical industry. A couple of years ago, Forbes did an analysis where they basically looked at how much money each company was spending on research and development and divided that by the number of new drugs that they launched. AstraZeneca, their estimate was $12 billion for a new drug. That is just completely unsustainable. Let's think of the cost of new medicines. Two years ago, Vertex launched a new treatment for cystic fibrosis. It's very effective, but it only works in 4% of the patients. They are charging $300,000 a year. That's almost, what, $900 a day. Who can afford that? Many pharmaceutical companies, because they haven't delivered enough drugs, they are pulling out of certain areas. They're reducing their efforts in neuroscience. Many of them have shut their efforts in psychiatry because
coming up with a treatment in these diseases has just not been successful for them. There hasn't been sufficient return on investment. This is at a time when we desperately need more treatments for depression, as Jonathan has just outlined, schizophrenia, autism, etc. There's also another challenge. In the biomedical community today, there is massive, massive duplication and wastage. What happens is that many academic groups, many biotechs, and many pharmaceutical companies, they all work on the same few ideas. And that's not surprising, because of course everybody reads the same literature, they go to the same conferences, and they talk to the same opinion leaders. So what happens is all these groups and companies, they work in parallel, in secret, in competition. They spend five, six, seven years trying to come up with a proprietary molecule, one of their own molecules. And then when they test this molecule for the first time in patients, so what we call phase 2A studies, the failure rate is more than 90%. So can you imagine? I don't know any other industry where they invest in an area for six, seven years, only to find out then, nine times out of 10, they fail. Now, for any one company, that is a tragic waste of resource. It's also a tragic waste of people's careers. But when you think that there's 20 companies doing the same thing in parallel, in secret, this is a horrendous waste of money. But it's also a horrendous waste of patience. Because frankly, the way we are doing drug discovery today, we are exposing patients to molecules that other groups know are already destined for failure. It's unethical, frankly, it's immoral. So let me now share with you what we're trying to do in Oxford. And I have to say right at the outset, this has only been made possible by the support of the leadership in Oxford. So thanks to people like Andy and Nick and Alex who are sitting here, but also many of my colleagues back home, people like John Bell, Peter Ratcliffe, Alistair Buck and Ian Walmsley, Kay Davis, Mark Feldman, I could carry on all day. These guys have been wonderfully supportive. So what we're doing in Oxford is the following. We've decided to work on completely novel ideas, novel targets, novel proteins. And for those, what we do is we generate novel tools. And what's absolutely <coughs> unique is that these tools, we give them away. We give them to any academic, anybody in biotech, and anybody in pharma. Because we believe that's the best thing we can do to facilitate science and therefore facilitate drug discovery. The consequences of this have been profound. So to date, we are working very closely with nine large pharmaceutical companies. These companies are GSK, Pfizer, Novartis, Lilly, Abvi, Takeda, Boeing, Ringelheim, Janssen, and Bayer. And each of these companies are giving us access to their expertise, their infrastructure, and resource. In fact, they're contributing $8 million to our effort. And over the past two weeks, we've been approached by three other companies who want to join, and one of them has its headquarters in Japan. What's also happened is, you can imagine every academic who comes into my office wants to collaborate with us. Because they know we're generating these high quality tools and we give them away freely. We share all of our expertise, all of our reagents, etc. And that, frankly, that transparency creates a lot of trust, which is great for collaboration, it's great for science, and it's great for drug discovery. We're collaborating now with more than 250 labs across the world, many of them in Hong Kong, 
in China, in Japan, in Taiwan, in Singapore, and in India. What's now started to happen is that we've got biotechnology companies coming to us with proprietary platforms, and what they want to do is they want to put our new molecules into their platforms to get joint publications with us, but also they see us as a conduit into these nine large pharmaceutical companies. We've now got contract research organizations coming to us wanting to take our reagents, our tools, and convert them into clinical molecules which they will then sell on to Takeda and GSK and Pfizer, etc. This is facilitating drug discovery and of course we're delighted. More recently, we've had patient organizations coming to us. They're saying, look, we're desperate for new treatment. We'd like to take your reagents to try and create a pipeline of drugs in our own disease area. So in the UK, we're talking to Myeloma UK. So they have access to 5,000 patients with myeloma. They're going to take our molecules, put them onto human myeloma cells, and anything that kills that cancer, this patient organization is going to fund the generation of a clinical molecule and then the doing of that clinical study in myeloma patients. It doesn't even involve the pharmaceutical industry. This is creating a new ecosystem for drug discovery. And now what started to happen, you can imagine, we're generating new tools. Our academic network is generating new biology. And of course, you put new tools and new biology together, and that's the starting point for a new biotech. So many of our academic collaborators are now creating biotechs. And as Andy announced this morning, literally a month ago, we received 11 million pounds from the British government to build a bioescalator to basically facilitate the creation of more biotechs in Oxford and in Oxfordshire. Let me just give you one example of a success. Three years ago, we generated an inhibitor for a novel protein. It's called BET. The name doesn't really matter. But what we did was we showed that this molecule killed a very rare type of cancer called a nut midline carcinoma. When we generated that molecule, our collaborator in Harvard wanted to take that molecule into patients because he knew that anybody that's diagnosed with nut midline carcinoma within three to six months, they're dead. There is nothing out there that treats that cancer. Since then, that molecule we have given out to 400 labs across the world. These labs have now shown that that molecule works in a whole range of other cancers. They've shown that it works in a model of sepsis. They've shown that it works in a model of cardiac hypertrophy. And they've even suggested it could be a target, a new target, for a male contraceptive. This is crowdsourcing early science. This is what we're doing by generating these high quality reagents. Now, we published that molecule back in December 2010. By May last year, so in two and a half years, there was a further 172 publications based on our paper. This is how much we facilitated science. And our colleague in Harvard has secured $15 million of VC funding to set up a biotech in Boston to take that target all the way forward into patients. And also what's happened is that now, three years on, there are five companies with their own molecule in the clinic. Now this is totally unprecedented. A completely novel target into the clinic in three years, but this has held five companies. So generating these molecules has had a massive impact on science, a massive impact on drug discovery, and has helped in the creation of new companies. What we're now trying to do is the following. We're now not just going to generate tools 
we're now going to generate clinical molecules and we're going to take those clinical molecules into patients completely in the open. It sounds absolutely harebrained, but the experiment has started. We've already started working with Cancer Research UK to take a completely novel target all the way to patients in the open. Four weeks ago, Takeda, our colleagues at Takeda, so Tashi Yamada, their head of R&D, and Tetsu Mariyama, their head of research, they've agreed to take a novel target for Alzheimer's all the way to patients completely in the open. We're having a discussion with the Canadian government to do this in psychiatry and with the Helmsley Trust in New York to do this in inflammatory bowel disease. So in summary, by reducing secrecy and competition in the early phase, we're bringing together academic labs with lots of pharmaceutical companies, with biotechs, with CROs, with patient groups. I haven't talked about the regulatory agencies, but they're involved as well. Underpinned with public and charitable funds to create a new <coughs> ecosystem for drug discovery. Ladies and gentlemen, I believe this is the only way we will discover a drug that's going to slow down the progression of Alzheimer's. Thank you very much. Um, researching uh, quietly 
and uh, away from the public eye is something called the, the, the profit motive. Um, you're creating a new ecosystem um, whereby the results of this research is, is spread much more rapidly. What's the replacement incentive for the profit motive that you are using to fuel the success of the ecosystem? Well, I'm hoping that this new ecosystem will deliver more clinically validated and de-risk targets. So these are targets that we know in patients are going to deliver a new medicine. So by working together, working at the 9 in 10 that is complete garbage, and working at the 1 in 10 that's likely to deliver a medicine, what industry can then do is to focus on those 1 in 10. So they can concentrate their resources, they can develop proprietary assets for those, industry benefits, and of course patients benefit. The problem at the moment is, everybody's working on that 9 in 10 that's just complete rubbish. And it's just a complete waste. And of course the problem is, nobody publishes their, their negative findings. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes complete sense. I, I just... Um I'm searching for the um, complement to the profit incentive. Uh, so, so it's a genuine desire by those developing the ecosystem to improve human welfare, notwithstanding their private sexual interest. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Um, there's one over there. And actually, I think I'm going to ask everyone, please, to give us their name and their college. Let's have a little college competition here. <laughs> um, which colleges are, are getting up front with the question? So, I'm sorry, yes. And then, and then the gentleman in front next. I thought I would stand up so I can see okay. you. I'm Hanning Liu, St. Hughes College, 2012, Public Policy. Um, so I'm currently living in Beijing. Um, I had a very uh, layman question, but very pressing one for uh, Professor Liu and Professor Flint. So what would be the impact of smog or air pollution? And on you know, people living in uh, Chinese cities nowadays in terms of having the possibilities of having cancer without genetic components uh, or reasons. And also, should we be worried about getting depressed because of that? And if the answer is yes, what can we do in terms of dealing with the depression? Thank you. Okay, well. Maybe I'll, I'll try to answer part of it first. And I think uh, clearly we now going back to study more and more about how environmental factors could affect the cancer incidence. I mean, the esophageal cancer I was telling you about is uh, generally believed to be associated with smoking and alcohol. That's the Chinese version, if you like. But uh, how does that affect it is something we really don't know. It's just an association. And I think by understanding the fundamental one, hopefully I should be able to answer that, smog. And uh, that clearly could have some um, possibility, but I have no experimental evidence whatsoever. It's too early to say. Linking it with the newer, you know, the, what Jonathan talked about, depression, he mentioned about mitochondrial metabolism. Actually, the metabolism defect or deregulation is also very important in cancer incidence and cancer development. So it is a lot of things in the cells in our body is all interconnected. And I think it, I'm next door to Jonathan in Oxford, so maybe that will be a new collaboration out of this. <laughs> So I, I have colleagues who live in Beijing, and uh, the pollution makes them depressed. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> and most of them think the answer to this is to come to a country which doesn't have so much pollution. But I can tell you, living in Oxford, the weather is pretty miserable. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure there's a cure there. <laughs> this looks like a serious case of double jeopardy. Yeah. <laughs> Good morning, I'm Michael Wong from Keller College, and I read, uh, I read Global Health Science in Oxford. And um, I have a question for uh, Professor Liu and Professor uh, Flint. Um, it's about China, and uh, I would like to ask, uh, no doubt, you know, cancer and uh, depression account for a significant part of the disease burden in China nowadays and in the future. And do you think, how, uh, well, 
Let me rephrase. How successful do you think China is doing in generating uh, support from the commercial world? And for example, also in the, uh, 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 from charitable organizations, in supporting you know, research in uh, these two areas? And how, do you think those support will be sustainable in the next 10 or 20 years in the future? I could answer you about the cancer site. I actually did my master degree in Beijing and in the Cancer <coughs> Institute, which is very well known to study esophageal cancer. And I haven't studied that after I left China. And I think in China, most of the funding, as you know, is mainly coming from the government. And the, really, the charity uh, support is very limited. And I think it's, um, the grants funding model is also a problem to prevent people to have an innovative uh, study. I mean, I think it, um, the VC Andy said yes, um, yesterday beautifully. When you have knowledge, a lot of time you really have no idea what that knowledge is going to tell you. And there are lots of things we do with the basic research. We actually not necessarily know the implication of that in the clinic immediately, but we just do the basic research we think is potentially might be important. And that certainly has not been most active in China. I'm quite familiar with that. And that, but I think that hopefully in the future, with some of the philanthropies, maybe they will have some funding which allows people to do things which is fundamentally important, doesn't have the immediate uh, implication immediately. So, so are you asking whether we think that um, the Chinese government is supporting a research area in this, uh, in these conditions. Is, is that what you're asking? They're not putting enough money in. Yeah? Yeah. Well, no, they're not. Get more. They put a lot of money into cancer research. <laughs> but I've never met a scientist who thinks quite enough money. <laughs> 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 it's a motto. Yeah. Yeah. Um, a question in the front there, and then one in the third row. No, in the front. Uh, the first. <laughs> yeah. I'm Hi, uh, Mimi Mo, a Christchurch, th uh, 2003 Pharmacology, and uh, I'm currently working for GSK in medical affairs, specializing in neurology as well as uh, respiratory medicine. So, is uh, uh, the question is on the laser phase of uh, drug development, which is market access. So um, it's really invigorating to be seeing, uh, you know, also doing something that is novel, identifying drug targets, and also speeding up the R&D process. But at the same time, you know, what we're seeing, I think, in the uh, pharmaceutical industry is, is patient focus. So um, we have all those drugs, but at the same time, after we've marketed uh, all these therapies, it is so hard to actually get into the special formulary. Uh, in, in NHS or in the uh, hospital authority in Hong Kong. So there is a special category where doctors have to actually put through all the scientific evidence to show that um, this is what the patients need uh, and also to change guidelines to push your drug into a frontline or seven line drug, for example, in oncology or in respiratory medicine. So the difficulty is not only that we spend so much money on uh, researching, but at the same time, is we actually can't get drugs into the proper people and because that process takes years uh, and also takes, and it also involves a lot of politics uh, in, in the kind of healthcare system, that we actually cannot um, give patients the relevant drugs in a costly manner. So um, the question is for all of you, um, are there uh, kind of processes or frameworks that will actually accelerate uh, market access? So, yes, well, we start. so my sense is that if um, academics and regulators and patient groups are involved in that whole research and development phase, then I'm more hopeful that it will be easier to get those molecules on the market and <coughs> be funded, if you like, for the pharmaceutical industry. I think we've just got to work closely together. We've got to break down these barriers. We've, you know, these barriers need to be a lot more porous. Um, I think the fact is, I think a lot of people don't appreciate how difficult drug discovery is. 
um, and how expensive the whole process is. Um, and one of the things that concerns me is that uh, the regulators and society want squeaky clean drugs. So a drug that has no side effect. And frankly, as scientists, we know that that's impossible. You know, whenever we take in a drug, we're basically managing the intake of a poison. You know, if I took a teaspoonful of salt every day, there would be consequences. So I think we just need, it's, it's about working together, it's about everybody appreciating the challenges, etc. I mean, I've worked in GSK, as you know, and uh, I think the industry does a fantastic job. It employs incredibly smart people. Uh, it is trying to do the right thing, but the whole game is so difficult. So, Professor Flint, um, from, from the front line, when you, when you talk to clinicians and patients, do they also drive R&D uh, in, in terms of changing guidelines and making sure that these patients actually get what they need? So there's a clinical assessment. We have to decide what's most suitable for each patient. But in terms of that driving the new drugs, no, I, I couldn't improve on what Chas has just told you. Thank you. Chas, just as, as a moment, are there moves afoot to see if one can fast track some drug uh, introductions? I thought that people are <coughs> working on exactly that problem, and Jim, perhaps you have a, a comment there. Absolutely. I mean, this is something that. Uh, John Bell, our region's professor, is something that he's pushing very much in the UK and certainly in Canada as well. So accelerated development. Yeah. Right. Thank you. Well, maybe I'll quickly add to that is for cancer. I mean, at the moment, what we're trying to do is to identify the correct population of patients. And so what I told you about the potential to do the cancer prevention, why I choose these two cancer types, we know a high risk of population. So if we have a good biomarker, we will be able to say 1% of the gastritis people would likely to get gastric cancer, or maybe 0.1% of the Barrett's esophagus patients are likely to get uh, the esophageal cancer. They should be the focus to survey and to prevent. So that's personalized, you know, sort of identify the high risk of patients it is what's uh, most needed and then treat effectively. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Rick Saludo, um, Said Business School Strategy and Innovation 2011. Um, a question for each one of you. If you, had, if you could ask governments or international organizations or both to do one thing in your particular area, what would it be? And I think it would be good to hear this, and especially with Lord Patton here, perhaps you could uh, pass it along to <laughs> <laughs> the people he meets with uh, at Bridge. Um, and secondly, um, the developing world is very keen to participate in this kind of research. What mechanisms can Oxford offer, or your institutes, to enhance that? There are you know, many schools, research centers, and schools of medicine uh, all over Asia and, of course, uh, other parts of the world. They're very keen to be involved in this, and there, if there are ways in which they can participate in this, well, it, of course, it enhances your research, and it lifts the caliber of uh, learning and research in the rest of the world. Thank you. I'll, I'll start then. So, <laughs> um, it's difficult. So, um, I think it's an instructive example um, in the US where um, uh, the guy who set up the Simons Foundation, it must be called Simons, his first name, yeah. um, James, Jim, Jim, Jim Simons, decided that something needed to be done about a disease he had a particular interest in, which was <laughs> autism. And he felt that the um, assembled researchers were not doing a good enough job. And he took a very simple approach to this, which is that he got up a, a list of um, good scientists, best scientists, whether they were working in that area or not, just a list of very good scientists. And he went round to them and said, look, 
you should be working in this area. This is a very important disease. Here's 10 million, 5 million, or whatever it's going to cost to get you interested. And that proved to be an extremely successful way. And that foundation, almost alone, has changed our understanding of many aspects of that disease. So I think a very focused approach can help. Now, I have one question somewhere in the middle section. I have two, actually, but uh, I put this, no? They're all being shy. In that case, oh, actually, I think it was you. Yes, there, and then there, right? And then there, and then there. Yep. Thank you, uh, Prof. Eric and the uh, PPE Exit 74. Um, I was concerned about those uh, nine and ten examples of private uh, research uh, that failed. It would seem that there is a mechanism, there could be a mechanism, whereby early results in failure could be shared and some recovery be done from those who are already investing in a similar project. To know, well, let me stop here and I will contribute either. Private partnership. So there's public funds, there's many private companies involved. And so the idea is that we will pool our resources and our expertise and take some of these ideas all the way into the clinic and identify those nine in 10. So this is a way, rather than 20 companies doing that experiment in parallel, we do it once and we do it well and we share the data. Uh, and then once we've identified that one in 10, the plan is that these companies and anybody else, because we will publish that data, can then develop proprietary assets. So uh, absolutely, that's exactly what we're trying to do. So just partly tying that back to an earlier question, one of the motivations for companies is simply that they, you are generating targets for them, and they have had none for a long time. So it's not merely a charitable interest, if you like, in human welfare. There's also, fortunately, enlightened self-interest as a persisting driver. Well, Nick, I often get asked the question, uh, why are these nine companies giving us $8 million? Because we're going to make everything freely available. We're going to publish it anyway, etc. And of course, the answer to that is that they get access to one $64 million of other private funding. They get access to all of our public funding. They get access to our academic network of 250 labs, which is not easy to get. They have an opportunity to send scientists to our labs, and they have a chance to tell us what targets to work on. Yeah. So, thank you. I, mean, I, I think that's perhaps the bigger answer to your question. But thank you. Hi. Um, uh, Sonny Wong from uh, Green Templeton, and um, I did my degree in genetics, and I'm a medical person. So um, again, a question about drug dis um, discovery and development. And um, one problem that I see is that people are uh, very concerned about the safety of the drugs, and um, so um, uh, you know, uh, companies or, or academics they have spent million um, or billion. Uh, um, dollars in, in drug development and then they've got a drug and sometimes after marketing they are um, withheld, withdraw uh, because of uh, some safety issue and uh, one um, one uh, example is Vios uh, which were withdrawn from the market and um, do you think that people are too concerned about the safety to the point that it impedes development and um, one example is that I always think that if aspirin was developed today, then probably it wouldn't get into the market it, because it causes bleeding of the, get, uh, of the stomach. But actually it benefits and it saves so many people. So I think, do you think it's a problem at all that like it impedes further drug development? Um, well, maybe I could answer that in two ways. Uh, I'm not convinced that you can assess safety in animal models. I think what often happens is that in animals, we carry on shoveling in the compound until we see the effect we want. But in animals, we can't pick up things like, say, nausea or migraine. And often when we take that molecule into the clinic, we're dose limited by those sorts of side effects, etc. I think your latter point about sort of, you know, there are some side effects that we're only going to pick up once the molecule has been into hundreds and thousands of patients. So you can't do that in a normal clinical development program. But I think your question does relate to my earlier comment that when we launch a new drug, we need to think in terms of risk and benefit. And I'm a little concerned that everybody wants something that gives the benefit, but there's no risk. And scientifically, unfortunately, that is impossible. Right. 
uh, one in the front here. We're getting close to time, so very quick questions, fantastically snappy answers. You've been doing well so far. Try doing even better. Let's see how many more we can get in in the next one minute. Hello, um, Kunta Chobanathan uh, was at Keeble College. I studied uh, MBA at uh, Side Business School. The question I have is I read a couple of days ago um, that the social networks that we have and the people that are our support network actually has a great impact on how happy we feel. And, uh, and I'm assuming that has an impact on how less depressed we feel as well. So just thinking, uh, with modern technology and you know, social networking um, you know, growing so rapidly, how is that impacting on the levels of depression? Are, are we feeling um, it, there's an impact on that? And secondly, also, I mean, historically, we've been very um, impacted by uh, proximity, you know, support network because of proximity, but now we're connected globally um, so easily. So is that having an impact on, um, on you know, some of those diseases we see? Uh, good questions, no idea what the answer is. <laughs> that was very quick. That, that's exactly time. I'm going to give you one more question. I'm going to give you one more question. There's, there's a, a page of question over there. That's you. Yeah. Of course, you're going to have to ask it quickly. Yes, yes. I'm honoured. Last question. Uh, Peter Maher, Corpus Christi. Um, I thank you first for all, all three professors and indeed your colleagues to uh, working on, uh, on so many ways uh, on the well-being of our health and indeed uh, humanity. Now, I hear a lot of uh, words like uh, mitochondria, metabolism, genetics and and so on. And uh, obviously you guys are doing everything you possibly can and your colleagues to, um, to solve all those complex questions for our uh, well-being. And the question I, I, I direct is, uh, what is it that we can do for ourselves? Oh, what can we do for ourselves? This is, this is wonderful. This is one of those, <laughs> no, we'll start with that. What can we do for ourselves? We'll do each of you ought to give us a line on what can we do to improve our own health. Be careful what you eat and do lots of exercise. <laughs> <laughs> and maybe you should take up some uh, meditative practice. What was the um, mindfulness? Mindfulness, right? <laughs> Jim? Well, keep happy, right? <laughs> well, <laughs> Just I mean, that, that's an excellent note on which to end this morning. Can I first ask you all to thank our three speakers, who I think we absolutely know. Second, to prove that my jet lag isn't too bad, I have remembered that I have to tell you something that my, both my brain and my mitochondria have been getting antsy about, which is it's lunchtime for you all. <laughs> but third, because my jet lag has been slightly um, impairing my cognitive faculties, I'm apologizing for having introduced Shin Lu as Shin Li. <laughs> so there you are, jet lag gets even the best of us. <laughs> have a great lunch, great afternoon, and thank you very much for what you've put into this morning. It's been just wonderful.